Chris Hyatt. It's funny, I just recorded this and I had just glanced at the title because I look at the titles, I don't know what the Lord's going to say out of my mouth, so I just kind of see the title and kind of let God go where he's going to go with what's coming out of me. But it's funny because I started to record this and it was, uh, it's about salvation and I was going to talk about how, you know, there's no such thing as the four spiritual laws and all these other things that we've made up in order to make it easier to understand, which kind of complicates things and makes it crazier in a lot of ways. But anyways, one of the things that you have to be careful of is that you could be an educated idiot or you could be an intelligent saint. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you see, an intelligent saint recognizes they don't know it all. So the more you know, when you become more intelligent is the way of knowledge and the more knowledge that you get the more you realize that you don't know that you become more humble in what you do know because you recognize that there's so much more that you need to know and so that's what an intelligent saint becomes because at first sometimes people get really like educated idiots they take theology and run with it and start beating each other up with it and whatever little bit they learned they take it as a club and just stomp on somebody with it have you ever seen anyone like that you know, have you ever done it? I know I have. <laughs> My family, when I first got saved, I beat them to death with just a few scriptures. You know, and that's what I mean by that. You take what little bit you know, and you try to ram it down someone's throat. That's not the way it works. God doesn't ram things down people's choice, people's freedom of choice, but he gives them the opportunity to decide for themselves. And that's why it's about an intelligent faith, not just blind faith, not just a commitment that's made where now that people are arguing about, well, did they truly make a commitment and are they truly Christians and do, should they really be using the word truly when they don't know what truly means? <laughs> truly. But the point being is that getting carried away about what they say, they forget what it means today to be simple, to be caring, to be sharing what Jesus said and what Jesus is and the reality of the experience that they've had. So I decided that I'll re-record it since I didn't go in the right direction I was planning on and God seemed to say, you know, it's getting a little confusing. And I'll just go with what Upmost seems to be saying, which is definitely not what I thought it was. And recognize that this is speaking to people that are already saved. So this isn't a salvation message. This is to you who either know the Lord or you think you know the Lord and you know why you do or you think you know why you do. So let's read what the Lord would say because it's obviously giving us some insight into what is going on in when we say that we're saved and when we say that we're born again. So my utmost for its highest today is signs of the new birth. You must be born again, John 3.7. The answer to the question, how can a man be born when he is old, is when he is old enough to die. To die right out of his rag rights to his virtues, to everything, and to receive unto himself the life which was never there before. The new life manifests itself in conscious repentance and unconscious holiness. That's really deep. <laughs> what he's saying is that when you're old enough to figure out that you're not what you think you are and that what you thought you were isn't as good as you think you are, then you're old enough to know to become born again because you know that you're in you, you're not as wonderful Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect as you thought you were. So that's why he says that when you become born again, then this new life that Jesus puts in you that is a walking with him, that you're turning away from the world and its ways, that you're suddenly you have a unconscious or you're unaware of a holiness that he's put in you, that you're different, that you are separated unto himself. As many as received him, John 1.12, is my knowledge of Jesus born of internal spiritual perception or is it only what I have learned by listening to others? Have I something in my life that connects me with the Lord Jesus as my personal savior? All spiritual history must have a personal knowledge for its bedrock. To be born again means that I see Jesus. 
And the reality of a relationship is that you could talk about it and be distant. You could say you have it and never be connected. You could pretend or contend that you have by faith something that you never have possessed by relationship in the reality of being able to share, care, and be communicative with Jesus himself inside you as he speaks in a still small voice or outside you as he arranges the circumstances, as you read his word, as he applies it to your mind, as he makes it fit into your daily living, as he chooses to speak to you in that way. So there's lots of different ways that he can speak, but you'll know and you should be able to say to yourself that yes, I have a personal relationship with Jesus and you know it because you have seen Jesus in some way whether circumstantial, whether directive, whether audible, or whether emotive in the sense of feeling that confidence that you have inside, that you know, that you know, that you know. So in some respect, there's a wide variety of experiences that different people have at different levels, but all levels are the same in the sense that God brings you upward to himself so that you could know him in a personal and intimate way. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. Do I see signs of the kingdom, or do I perceive God's rule? The new birth gives a new power, a vision, whereby I begin to discern God's rule. He is in control, and I begin to see it, and I know it. His rule was there all the time, but true to his nature, now that I have received his nature, I can see his rule. In other words, I can see how God is using the circumstances of my life, as well as in the lives of others, after I have become born of the Spirit, so I can see how he moves in people and how he infuses his love through the circumstances to cause other people to go in the direction that he wants them to because I've lived long enough with him and I participated in him to know that he chooses his own way to do things that is beyond my understanding and comprehension, but now that he opens my eyes to see it, I can watch as he does his work in the hearts and lives and minds of other people. And that's what it talks about, that you cannot see the kingdom of God, but when you are born again, you see that working out in all of Christendom, in every person's life that you come into contact with. You will begin to know by way of experience and God speaking to you and showing you how he operates. And it's beautiful and wonderful, though it may be long-term in the sense of sometimes accomplishing what you think he's trying to do. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, 1 John 3, 9. Do I seek to stop sinning, or have I stopped sinning? To be born of God means that I have the supernatural power of God to stop sinning. In the Bible, it is never, should a Christian sin. The Bible puts it emphatically, a Christian must not sin. The effective working of the new birth in us is that we do not commit sin. Not merely that we have the power to not sin, but that we have stopped sinning. 1 John 1, 3, 9 does not, first, John 3, 9 does not mean that we cannot sin. It means that if we obey the life of God in us, we need not sin. See, the reality is, is that for a born-again Christian, sin is a choice, and you make that choice based upon your own decision-making process, because you know the consequences of it. You know that you have the ability to refuse it. You have that capability of calling upon God or choosing his way of avoiding it completely or finding a way of salvation out of it. But you make the determination to go beyond that choice process to participate in it. But the other people who are not born again of the Spirit of God and have not Jesus and his, his literal life working inside them and don't have that ability to choose have to sin. They need to sin. They go to those things because they cannot resist. They have no ability to do otherwise. Though they may at times do good, it's not their nature to automatically be able to refuse to do those things that they should not, with which God has told us that we ought to do other things, which is what we seek when we are born again, to walk not after the flesh, but after the things of the Spirit. So that's what God is really saying in a simple way, if that made sense to you. And if it didn't, replay the tape. No. <laughs> because after all, my utmost for his highest is never the easiest thing to do. It's always the utmost thing to do. And Chambers always has a way of bringing it all into us that he causes us to really think through what we're saying and doing and then applying what he's already brought to us so that we could live as God would have us to live. Giving all of our lives to him so that he could bring it back to us born again of his will and his choice and his life in us because that's what it's really about 
we're born from above by the spirit that comes down in us and brings us back to him and will take us out of this world back to heaven so god places his spirit in us so that we will one day go home to be with him 